uh, I would like to introduce myself. So I'm Erdanis Kostadenidis. I am Associate Professor in the Second Academic Department of ENT in Thessaloniki in Aristotle University. And I'm the head of the uh, Rhinology Lab uh, in this department. So my main interest is olfactory disorders, trigeminal function, and uh, of course, in general, rhinology. But uh, today we will speak about the intranasal trigeminal function and clinical implications. So within the next minute, I will give you some aspects about the clinical anatomy and physiology, focusing on the relation between the trigeminal function and olfactory function. Uh, we have to deal with two systems really very well coordinated and cooperated. Trigeminal function and the relation with the nasal airflow, which is really significant. And we will see many things to happen within the next year, I think, because now we focus on how we can perceive the uh, nasal airflow through the trigeminal function. And of course, last but not least, the trigeminal function and its relation with nasal defense mechanisms. Of course, we will say some things about the clinical assessment, how we can measure this function. And uh, finally, how we can use this information uh, in nasal pathology, what we know at the moment. So when we talk about the trigeminal nerve and the nose, we speak about two divisions, the ophthalmic and the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve, which is innervating the anterior and the posterior uh, nasal cavity, respectively. So when you think about the nasal mucosa, don't forget that it is innervated by the trigeminal nerve, including the uh, olfactory region. So uh, a friend is coming in, in the middle of of the session, but anyway, forget it. So uh, if we take a biopsy from the olfactory cleft, then we will see also at this part of the mucosa free endings of the trigeminal nerve. So from the beginning, the two systems are cooperating. So the other thing is that most odorants stimulate both systems. So every odorant has a component component, olfactory component plus the trigeminal component. So some others are more olfactory, let's say, and some others are more trigeminal, but it's not black and white. And even more, the same odorants at higher concentrations are becoming, let's say, more trigeminal. So the trigeminal system in higher concentrations suppress the olfactory system. So, Let's talk about trigeminal receptors. This belongs mainly to the uh, transient receptor potassium family. And these receptors are sensitive both in different temperatures and different chemicals. Let's give two classic examples. The first one is menthol. When we smell menthol, we feel patent nose, it's open, but nothing changed. So we have the same feeling with the cool temperature, the cool air. And the opposite, when uh, we uh, sniff chili pepper, so we have this burning sensation, which is similar to higher uh, temperatures, like 50 degrees. In some countries, when we go, we feel this dry and uh, burning sensation inside the nose. So if you see textbooks some a couple of decades before, it was really clear what is different between the olfactory system and the trigeminal one. In olfactory system, we had to deal with specific bipolar cells. We knew how it works. Okay, we have the bipolar cell. The odorants are coming, binding into the, into the receptors, and then we have a potential. But this was the opposite of the trigeminal, where we had only free endings, not something special, uh, within the nasal mucosa. But now, we have a new guy in the neighborhood which is called solitary chemosensory cell. And this is innervated by the trigeminal nerve. So in the apical end of this cell, we have the T2R receptors, which are really significant in the defense mechanisms of the nose. We will see later on what is uh, their role. So what is the difference between the free endings of the bipolar cells? 
Uh, you can see in this uh, slide that mainly the lipid soluble stimuli are going to uh, uh, the free endings, but the water soluble stimuli uh, are going to the apical end of the um, uh, solitary chemosensory cells because they cannot go between uh, and within uh, the tight junction of the uh, nasal epithelium. So let's see an example. What about these bitter receptors innervated by the trigeminal nerve? We have the example of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So some peptides are excreted from the Pseudomonas. So these receptors are taking this under brackets bitter protein into the receptor and then this connection produces a calcium ions influx and this NO production which leads into actions. First, more and uh, faster ciliar bit frequency. So it's a good mechanism against these toxic peptides uh, in the surface of nasal epithelium. And the second one, NO can act directly to the uh, uh, microbes, killing directly uh, the pseudomonas. So it's, it's a really uh, strong um, dual defense mechanism um, associated with the bitter receptors uh, on SECs. So in general, talking about the trigeminal nerve, when we have an environmental stimuli, regardless if it is allergic, irritant, or uh, environmental chemosensory stimuli, then we have two roads to have a reaction. One is the orthodromic, the well-known, okay, it goes through the trigeminal ganglion to the brain, and then through the brain goes out through the autonomic nervous system. The imbalance of sympathetic and parasympathetic produces vasodilatation, rhinorrhea, and uh, uh, plasma exudation. But we have a shortcut because directly from the nerve uh, endings, we can have the action reflex, the antidromic way, which means that neuropeptides like the substance P or the NKA, neurocreatine A or CGRP can act in a similar way, producing directly acting to the glands and to the vessels, and then uh, our patient has uh, rhinorrhea, vasodilatation, plasma exudation. So, finally, trigeminal nerve is a multimodal nerve because through this nerve we have somewhat sensory perception, chemosensory perception, we talked about uh, its relation with olfaction. Um, uh, it contributes to nasal inflammation, the, the so-called neurogenic inflammation, a very well-known pathogenetic mechanism in idiopathic rhinitis. Um, it's, uh, it's a part of the trigeminal uh, contribution to this disease. And it activates the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And of course, uh, is a part of uh, remote reflexes like the nasonasal, nasocardiovascular, and nasobronchial, like cough and sneezing. So, as we are in Greece, let's think about trigeminal nerve as a guardian of the uh, upper airway system, because a sentinel of the airways. Uh, so it monitors what harmful substance is coming against the nasal epithelium and is involved to detect and clearing these inhaled substances. So odorants can stimulate the somatosensory system through uh, polymodal uh, nociceptors, giving the sensation of touch when we uh, touch our nose, so trigeminal nerve is working to uh, give this information. Of course, pain, we feel the pain inside the nose, and we feel the temperature. So, for example, uh, uh, stinking is coming from alpha, alpha delta fibers, the afferent fibers, and burning from the C fibers. And what is really nice to see is that this function is not unified across the nose. So mechanoreceptors are at the back of the nose, although we feel that the first sensation was, okay, 
most probably will be in the anterior because we feel the air through the anterior part, but this is not the case. So what we feel in the anterior portion of the nose is mainly um, chemoreceptors activated. And we will see what happens. So the wider the nose at the level of the nasal valve, for example, we found that it's more chemosensitive. Maybe nature tries to fill the gap between a wider nose and the feeling that we have. And then Cao and his team came to give us a really nice paper showing that what we feel as uh, air patency, nasal patency, in the anterior part of the nose is coming from nasal mucosa cooling. So we feel a patent nose if we uh, breathe cool air. So the heat loss actually in the anterior part of the nose, this is giving the nasal uh, patency, the feeling of nasal patency. Or, as we said before, if we smell mint, which is the same thing. And if we see this paper coming from Germany and one of my colleagues, they proved that if we smell mint, many of the uh, people uh, participating uh, in this study said, okay, my nose is open, I feel better, but the renal manometry results were the same, nothing changed. So, uh, talking about factors affecting this function, of course, female always do better than males. And aging, um, we have a, an aging, um, it's, uh, the trigeminal function exhibits an age-related uh, decrease throughout the year, similarly with the olfactory system. So how, how can we test this function? I have a red line dividing the more uh, simple tests that we can use in everyday clinical practice and uh, uh, the more sophisticated systems like the event-related potentials, mucosal potentials, functional MRI. Of course, these uh, uh, tests can be found only in selected uh, smell and taste clinics, are really expensive and require special equipment. So that's why in my talk today, I will focus in the more simple tests as uh, um, I want to show you how we, how we can test this in an in a, um, ordinary rhinology uh, lab or in an ordinary um, ENT uh, office. So first is the lateralization test. You can see here what we uh, use in, uh, in our lab, which is actually a three printed squeezing device. We have two bottles. One contains a menthol solution. One contains a, 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 um, an odorless solution. So blindly, 40 times, we can test where the menthol is coming from. Right, left, right, left, and we have a number after the 40 questions, which is ranging for normal people, usually around 35, so a score uh, between 30, 35, 40, of course, it is uh, um, expected to be normal. Don't forget that uh, people with olfactory loss have decreased lateralization tests, so always you have to ask in the history if there is a history of olfactory loss, because then uh, your results are biased. And um, what we consider now as a basis to uh, distinguish patients from uh, normal people is uh, uh, number 25, so 25 correct answers and less uh, should be considered as problematic or pathologic, let's say. Another test uh, which is recently um, published and we uh, participated in, in this production with uh, Brussels and, and Dresden universities is uh, something similar to um, sniffing stick test of olfaction. So this test uh, has a threshold uh, component, discrimination, identification in conjunction with the lateralization test. Of course, at the moment, we don't have a large normative data, but if you see uh, the results of the threshold test, it is quite easy to see that you can distinguish normal controls from CRS, for example, people, with or without polyps, 
as a score, for example, about seven is rather normal, but uh, less than seven, between four and five, let's say, it is uh, usually um, pathologic and pathognomonic for these disorders. The same with the discrimination and identification test. And third is the CO2 uh, pain threshold. This is uh, the last um, device that we've got in our lab. In this device, we try to find a pain threshold giving step-by-step -step higher concentrations of CO2 uh, inside the nose. And in a study done by Dresden, um, because this device is a replication of this uh, automatic device uh, fixed in, in, in Dresden, they, uh, the authors said that the test, re test reliability is really high. And of course, it, uh, this device can distinguish quite easily um, patients from uh, normal controls. So what means patients? Patients could be uh, people with olfactory loss first, because we know that they have elevated uh, thresholds in trigeminal function. But uh, now we continue the study focusing on nasal surgery. I'll give you some aspects of this uh, work later on. So finally, we use taste strips. How, why to use taste strips in order to see nasal function? Because it's an indirect way to see these, what, we, uh, what I said before about the bitter receptors. So if somebody has function, uh, functional and good number of bitter receptors in the oral cavity, it is rather, uh, uh, it's quite normal to have something similar inside the nose. So many authors now try to um, conclude what happens in the nose searching the bitter receptors in the oral cavity, and especially uh, bitter components of taste uh, tests. So let's see the clinical implications. Um, as I said before, the trigeminal system and the olfactory are really very well connected and interacted at many levels, from the olfactory bulb, from the brain, towards the olfactory mucosa. So in an anosmic patient, we have decreased cortex trigeminal earpiece, but if we measure the potentials at the level of nasal mucosa, we will see increased them, because olfactory system inhibits uh, at the peripheral level the trigeminal system. So when this inhibition goes away, then we have elevated um, uh, potentials at the mucosa. And then when the olfaction is restored, it comes back with uh, uh, better potentials in the brain and, of course, decreased in normal uh, mucosal potentials. So both systems go together in anosmia. Another diagnosis really um, interesting for me regarding the uh, trigeminal function is the empty nose syndrome. So you know that it's really difficult to diagnose this clinical entity. Why? Because there is no objective measurement of this. Many people had inferior turbinectomy without ENS symptoms, but many others had. How to diagnose this? It's a missing gap, I think, in, in our clinical armamentarium. So what we did is to test all these people with lateralization test. So we tested three groups, one ENS empty nose syndrome patients, one group with inferior turbinectomy but without ENS symptoms, and one group of controls. And what we saw that, uh, was that uh, the patients had significantly lower lateralization test results compared with the other two categories, even from people with inferior turbinectomy. You see that people with inferior turbinectomy without DNS symptoms had lower trigeminal function compared with the normal controls, but um, not really significant. So our results were replicated in a better way from Chao, who showed the same thing with uh, CFD uh, measurements. And why imp is important this information? Because we don't only 
actually, I hope that we don't do total inferior turbinectomies. Some people do. But uh, we do a lot of septal surgery, for example. Is it necessary? I remember this nice paper from Professor Eccles in, in the Wales with the title, What, if any, is the value of septal surgery? Trying to, to give you some aspects of necessity about septal surgery. You know that some people have completely straight septal, uh, septum, but they feel obstructed. Some other people have septal deviation, but they feel okay. So what's the point? Why, if we compare the objective measurements that we have through renal manometry, acoustic rhinometry, and the subjective feeling is a mismatch. So something is missing. And maybe what is missing is the trigeminal function, because we perceive nasal airflow through the trigeminal function. So in this study, in the middle, uh, I've done it when I was a resident, we found a high percentage of dissatisfied patients after septal surgery, almost close to 35%, despite the good renomanometric results. So it's not, it's not always nasal valve, but it's something which is missing, and I feel that this is a, a what we have to focus on the trigeminal nerve. Look at this study. What the author said is that if we have a high trigeminal lateralization test score, meaning that uh, I have a, a score above 35 before surgery, then this is a predictor of a satisfied patient postoperatively. So that's why I believe that we should, we have to put the lateralization test among the preoperative assessment before uh, nasal surgery for nasal obstruction in general, not only septoplasty. And again, uh, in a different paper, the team of Thomas Hummel in Dresden said that the most salient finding was the decreased trigeminal sensitivity before surgery. So maybe some patients are coming to us asking for surgery. They don't know why. So we see a septal deviation and we believe this is the problem, but not. Maybe it's not the septal deviation, but the decreased trigeminal sensitivity. And maybe this is the reason why we would have some dissatisfied patients after surgery. So that's why if we introduce the trigeminal testing before surgery, then maybe we will be more safe to predict uh, the outcome of uh, our operations. But it's not only septal surgery, it's a CRS. And, uh, uh, now, currently, we have some studies showing that people with the chronic rhinosinusitis have lower sensitivity in the trigeminal system uh, compared with normal subjects. And this uh, is more pronounced in the anterior part of the nose. And finally, about uh, the beta receptors, uh, at the moment, there are numerous studies assess CRS and the beta receptors trying to find different phenotypes, meaning that uh, we can use these taste trip tests, let's say, as a biomarker of a certain CRS phenotype and maybe uh, to relate this with a disease severity. Which part of the CRS could be less sensitive in beta receptors. At the moment, I would say that uh, looking at the studies, mostly CRS without polyps are more likely to be associated with a non-functional uh, type. I'll show you some results. In this study, the authors uh, showed a good correlation between the taste phenotype and in vitro biofilm formation, meaning that uh, if you uh, were not sensitive to taste, uh, strips in, in the taste test, then you had a higher uh, probability to develop uh, uh, biofilms in, in your nose. And again, uh, using uh, denatonium benzoate, another bitter uh, taste uh, stimuli, this group of authors showed that uh, they could distinguish in different concentrations very well normal subjects from CRS with polyps, CRS without polyps, the green line is the CRS without polyps, again, is uh, um, 
the group of patients with a lower sensitivity. And surprisingly, uh, the group of patients with a higher sensitivity was the aspirin exacerbated disease. So we have to look at this data and replicate again and again in order to um, have this phenotyping, which is really easy. Taste strips, especially the bitter one, it's just one taste strip in, in your uh, lab, and then maybe you can have some extra information useful for the management of uh, this disorder. Let's go to non-allergic rhinitis, the so-called idiopathic rhinitis. We know that the basis now of its pathophysiology is the neurogenic inflammation. And based on this fact, uh, we develop new kinds of treatments like capsaicin. For example, we know that if we see patients with idiopathic rhinitis, they have higher uh, threshold, uh, lower threshold than the normal. So that's why we see this kind of potentials at the mucosa with a quite small quantity uh, of an irritant, rather than normal. And then this comes back if you anesthetize this nerve index with capsaicin. Actually, capsaicin goes there, let's say it burns everything, the, uh, the free endings of the trigeminal nerve there, and then the potentials are uh, coming, um, being lower. So if we see the Cochrane library, capsaicin now is an option in the treatment of idiopathic non-allergic rhinitis because actually it works where we want in the T, uh, TRPV1 um, receptors of the free endings. Maybe in the future we will find other substances acting on the chemosensory cells, the solitary chemosensory cells, and then we will develop new therapeutic uh, options. So in conclusion, trigeminal nerves is an important nerve for the nasal physiology. It's a multimodal nerve, uh, plays many roles, not only chemosensory, but in the nasal airflow perception and the nasal mucosa defense mechanisms. So the trigeminal testing should be a part of uh, our clinical practice. And what we need is to optimize these methods to find actually which is the best method for what kind of pathology, what we look for, and um, in order to optimize our treatment and explore new treatment options. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, have you tested, have you done th these tests on, on patients before and after different techniques of turbinoplasty? Like for instance, radio frequency, uh, electrofulguration, or even uh, uh, partial resection techniques. Have you, have you done that study or not? Uh, I haven't done it, but I know a really nice paper from a friend of mine, uh, Johannes Frasnelli, who is really involved in the trigeminal um, research. And I think, as I can remember, uh, found uh, in uh, inferior turbine um, hypertrophy, lower thresholds in lateralization tests, and these thresholds were restored after radio frequency um, ablation. But Hypertrophy, we, we should focus what is the cause of hypertrophy. I think it depends on the cause. Maybe we should uh, compare people from coming from allergic rhinitis background. Maybe it's different with people with hypertrophy due to idiopathic rhinitis, etc. But at the moment, this is what we've got. I think the most important thing in, in, in recent papers is that there are people with nasal obstruction, subjectively, without clinical findings. So this is the part of people that we have to focus for lower transgeminal sensitivity, and then develop uh, the next steps. Yes? Thank you for your talk. Um, just have two questions. First is about the nasal obstruction and septal deviation. So in, in case of uh, when you're doing a lateralization test, so in case of uh, unilateral, unilateral nasal obstruction, uh, will it, 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 it 
it will affect the test in a way that, does it affect the test? You know, if uh, Actually, someone has a, a yeah. right nasal obstruction, yeah, it's a good a point. Right yeah. test, he will miss maybe most, he will miss uh, good answers on the, on the obstru obstructed side. You if press I'm me here. to give you information that I'm going to publish, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, actually when you do um, the lateralization test, you have information for both, separately, for both nasal cavities, yeah. because 20 stimuli are going to the left, right, 20 to the right side, okay? So then you know what's the difference between the two sides, and what we see at the moment is that if you have a deflected a septal deviation to the right side, then this side is lower than the other. And if you have hypertrophy of the uh, turbinate on the, uh, on the contra in the other side, then the results are equalized. So we have more or less the same results about nasal obstruction from a septal deviation and a turbinate hypertrophy, compensatory, let's say. Second question is just about your opinion on trigeminal uh, training. Trigeminal training? Yeah, to, to recover. Mm, yeah, I had this idea some years ago. We tried to do this in empty nose syndrome patients. We couldn't recruit many patients. Um, there is a paper saying that it works, but uh, I'm not really convinced that it works in the, um, in the, in the long term. Maybe it maybe gives you a, sens a better sensation for a while because uh, it works with continuous uh, smelling of menthol. Menthol is the best way to, uh, to feel a nasal patency. But um, yeah, maybe we need many papers on this. But at the moment, we don't have permanent results. I mean, maybe people feel better after five, 10 minutes, but it's not constant. Capsaicin. Till now, the standard way of treatment was uh, a full shot for one day. Some people uh, give capsaicin for five times in a day with an interval of one hour. But now, if you see, there is a trend towards lower concentration, but for many weeks. And I think there is a recent paper from uh, Laura Van Gerwen, uh, She's working really, uh, she, she's producing really nice papers on it. And she said that we have maybe equal results between the two techniques. If you give the standard concentration 0.1, I think, millimole of capsaicin five days in, in a day, or using lower, 10 times lower concentration, but in four weeks, once a day, which is, I think, better. Except the trigeminal, you mean? Except the trigeminal, or the trigeminal in central level. Because all these neuronal, neuronal pathways are very similar to chronic pain syndrome. Yeah. And very specific, you might label uh, instead of peripheral mm -hmm. uh, irritation. I don't know exactly other mechanisms, if are involved other mechanisms, but for sure it looks like it's not something only peripheral, but it, it is a central. Because, as I uh, said before, all these systems are connected, the chemosensory and the pain um, somatosensory systems. So maybe this decrease of peripheral um, uh, trigeminal function plays a role in a, in a central um, uh, in, in a central level to, to keep the pain uh, Although the, uh, itself, the capsaicin, produces pain, yeah. it's really painful when you apply capsaicin in the nose. And this actually was the reason why authors tried to decrease the concentration and make it uh, more prolonged uh, in, in several days. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you all for your participation. And See you later on. <laughs>